आयोग हैज फॉर्मुलेटेड अ नेशनल स्ट्रेटजी फॉर एस्टैब्लिशिंग अ न्यू इंडिया बाय 2022 एंड अर्ली इन द डे ऋतुपर्णा भुयान कॉट अप विद वाइस चेयरमैन राजीव कुमार एंड आस्क हिम इफ नीति आयोग इज टेकिंग कंजर्वेटिव स्टेप्स इन इकोनॉमिक ग्रोथ गोइंग फॉरवर्ड टेक अ लुक एट दैट इट्स नॉट अ कंजर्वेटिव अप्रोच एट ऑल आई थिंक बिकॉज़ वी टॉक अबाउट एन एवरेज ऑफ 8% over the next 5 years and you know as for example and this year is included in that and you'll get about 7 and a bit in this year and so therefore growth in the terminal year would have to rise towards double digit to get you an average of 8 right. and our uh, our uh, you may call it conservative but our aspiration is that if india can achieve 8% plus or 8% for the next decades you know few dec you know, few, few years i think we'll be doing very well in real terms mm -hmm. so so i i don't think it's, a, it's a, you know it's it's the it's laying the foundation for a double digit growth in the next in the in the years afterwards right since you are talking about you know an as aspiration of a double double digit growth the farm sector will have to play a very big role and you have recommendations on that saying that let's double of the farm farmers income but going by the current distress in the farm sector how realistic is it, do you think will be will be to 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 you know aspire for such a level and secondly you know what what uh, sustainable measures can we see as far as intervention on the farm sector loan waiver as we as many economists like you agree is is not a sustainable solution you know this is why the strategy talk about talk about creating agripreneurs you know and i think that's a very important word and you know i i hope the uh, importance is not missed because that implies the creation of agro processing industry at a much faster pace than what you have had so far and the value addition in agriculture and with the farmer participating in it like for example in some cases the fpo etc mm -hmm. in some fpos has been done is the way forward for farmers income to double not through raising agricultural output that's one part of it the second part of it is of course that you want to reduce the cost of production mm -hmm. because you know the, the the cycle of rising costs and rising msps and you know therefore rising indebtedness very often is also not the way forward mm -hmm. so this is why if you notice uh, we have been a little uh, bold in saying that we will look at zero budget natural farming in a very systematic way and i w i would like to tell you that niti aayog has actually now commissioned some studies to examine the validity the, you know of, of that approach because that promises to you know as, as the name implies a zero budget farming why not income support for the farming sector because many believe that perhaps that is a way forward sustainable way forward to could, could be looked at but that is more for the state government to decide because right. being the agriculture because that is what will substitute the 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 you know the subsidies that they give you know and then that's for the My state. last question sir you know as far as investment rate is concerned you are targeting around 36% of the gdp as investment rate currently you know we have seen a problem related to liquidity uh, that again is in impacting investment uh, where do you see the solution lying how do you think uh, b will the investment rate be in increased to such a level which uh, you know of, of course it will is and we have reached that level before it's not something that do you haven't reached before except that last time it was reached it was it was it was in some sense uh, wasted in a lot of unviable projects and so on which resulted in you know the higher capital output ratios and non performing assets mm -hmm. uh, this will come through one mobilization of household savings uh, improvement in government savings and or, you know and 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 corporate savings as well so the domestic mobilization of resources is something that we will see going forward much more because of the gst you know that you have found that that we've now improved and because of the you know the insolvency and banking code so the whole reform process is lending itself to greater domestic mobile resource mobilization moving on then to a cnbc tv 18 exclusive plans to revive the hydropower sector has been in the works for the past 4 years but now cnbc tv 18 learns that the government has finalized a cabinet note aimed at getting states to go in for hydropower the power ministry though feels that some states may not agree to a few of the proposed measures anshu sharma gets us all those details Let me quickly summarize that the draft hydro policy which the government has uh, brought in uh, has sought categorizing of large hydro projects as renewable energy so that it, it can enjoy the benefits of renewable the other idea which is part of the cabinet uh, note is uh, to increase the loan tenure for hydro projects uh, and provide no free power uh, that is around 12% of generation for 5 years to the states where these power projects of hydro are now sources at 
that R.K. Singh, Power Minister, in an industry meet recently said that uh, states uh, where uh, hydro projects are have objected to letting go of the free power provisions. He also mentioned that Ministry of Power will be writing to Reserve Bank of India and Department of Banking and uh, uh, will seek ways to increase loan tenure and uh, longer du duration for depreciation uh, uh, for the hydro projects uh, uh, since hydro projects have a longer life compared to other sources of energy. Uh, remember about 12% of uh, power generated from hydro in the state where these generations are happening is given to the state where the generation is happening. Power Minister also stressed on the fact that hydro-based power is crucial to balance uh, the increasing renewable energy availability in the system. Remember, 13% of India's total power capacity is constituted by hydro. For now, we'll have to wait and watch out as to when will the hydro policy see the light of the day. Back to you. Thank you, Anshu, for that. But moving on to our Rewind 2018 special then, it was the uncle-nephew duo of Nirav Modi and Mehul Choksi who made headlines throughout this year for an alleged scam of over 13,000 crore rupees. CNBC TV 18's Utkarsh Chaturvedi and Kevin Lee report that this dupe sparked off a chase that involved PSU banks, investigative agencies, as well as political parties, and in fact, multiple nations as well. Take a look at that report. From a celebrity dweller to an economic fugitive, Nirav Modi's glamorous life took a complete U-turn this year and played out like the plot of a blockbuster Bollywood movie. His partner in crime was his uncle Mehul Choksi of jewellery group Gitanjali Gems fame. The first signs that something was amiss came on the 5th of February when Punjab National Bank announced that it had reported a fraud of 264 crore rupees by Nirav Modi. The CBI registered an FIR that very day. But within a few days, the quantum of the alleged fraud had swelled to a whopping 13,000 crore rupees. And other investigative agencies like the SFIO, the Enforcement Directorate and the IT Department joined the hunt. As the bank itself admitted a week later, this was a scam which had been running for several years. But then came the twist which changed the entire narrative. Even before the investigative agencies could start their work, Nirav Modi and Mehul Choksi had fled the country. Confusion ensued. Arrest warrants and red corner notices followed. The alleged scam and the resultant manhunt soon became political ammunition. What happened? But the investigators flowed on and a modus operandi was put together. The investigative agencies alleged that Nirav Modi and Mehul Choksi were hand in glove with Gokul Nath Shetty, who was then deputy manager of PNB's Brady House branch and a few officials from PNB and other banks. These bank officials issued LOUs to other banks in the name of Nirav Modi and Mehul Choksi without making an entry in the books of the bank. Before these LOUs expired, new LOUs were issued to honour the earlier LOUs. The amount that the ED was able to seize via assets of the accused were also underwhelming. Independent valuers put this number at 2,000 crore rupees. Seizes continue and so far, the ED has attached assets and properties in India and abroad that all in all are valued at 4,000 crore rupees. Through it all, both Modi and Choksi maintained their innocence. Mehul Choksi, who is learned to have taken up Antiguan citizenship, has also tried to establish his innocence. I sent an email to the regional passport office, Mumbai, requesting them to revoke the suspension of my passport. However, I did not receive any reply from the regional passport office. Further. The regional passport office did not give any explanation as on why my passport has been suspended and how I was security threat to the India. Hence, as my passport was suspended, there was no question of surrendering the same. As things stand, the Modi government is trying to get back both Nirav Modi and Mehul Choksi to the Indian soil. And if any forward movement happens in both of these cases, this will strengthen the image of the Modi government just before the 2019 elections to be tough 
on white collar crimes. So keep an eye on both of these cases as a lot of action is expected in the early months of 2019. In Mumbai, Utkarsh Chaturvedi. Oh, well, yes, Utkarsh, we are waiting for that action to come by in the first half of 2019. Let's see whether the, uh, whether the duo comes back to India or not. But on that note, let's slip into a short break. Manisha Gupta will join in with all the currency and commodity action on the other side. Commodity space now where we have seen uh, the moves get certainly more volatile as the volumes are expected to go down from here. But not before you have yet another big event out of the way and that clearly is going to be the US Fed meeting where the announcement of an interest rate hike of course would be released and then we, uh, the markets are also looking at for some kind of commentary guidance uh, prospects for 2019 in sense of monetary policy and that would decide on how the asset classes will behave before we call it curtains on 2018. In the meanwhile, I, I do want to talk about the precious metal prices because remember when we started this year, almost most all banks and brokerages were bullish on this sector, but that's not exactly how we are closing this year. Gold and silver prices are closing 2018 into negative, where you have the gold price is down 5% and silver is down 14% as well. Well, it usually is said that silver is 1.3% more volatile than what gold does. So clearly that is into the prices. It also has been about, uh, you know, weaker jewelry demand, weak base metal performance, a high strength in US dollar, uh, investment in other asset classes like the treasuries and the equities that actually took the uh, flavor away from the precious metal prices. But the expectation is that you will see investment and allocation demand come back in case of sector. Those are, of course, the forecast for 2019 for silver, where you have Narexis, ABN AMRO, Capital Economics all saying that they expect the silver prices to average between 16 to 17 dollars per ounce. The best of the forecast really comes in from Bank of America Merrill Lynch at 18 dollars. But there are some uh, bearish voices as well, where you have JP Morgan and BNP Paribas expecting silver prices between 14 to 15 and a half dollars per ounce. So pretty much on what they did this year as well. Sumit Bagaria uh, now joins us with his strategies on that space. Sumit, hi. What is your own sense for the silver prices? Uh, are, you, are you bullish? Are you, do you think there could be some asset allocation that could actually go the silver way? Hi, Manisha. Uh, well, in last couple of days, we have seen that uh, silver has given a very good move from lower levels. But overall, looking at the chart, it seems that silver can move in a range. And the range can be between 39,500 on the higher side to... Uh, to 36,000, 36,200 on lower side. Till the time the range is not taken away, it uh, it will move in a uh, it will move in a uh, uh, in a very uh, in a very small range. I think either side breakout will give a very good upside move or downside move in silver. Upside resistance. If uh, silver is able to break the upside resistance, then we can see a move till 41,000 or 42,000 levels in next couple of months. At the same time, if the supports are taken away, then we can see a fall till 33,000 levels. Looking at this structure, it seems that sooner or later we will see upside breakout. So any dip in silver prices till uh, 37,000 or 37,100 levels in MCX should be used as buying opportunity and on higher side immediately we can see uh, levels of around 38,600 and 39,500 levels. These would be the immediate targets. A breakout above 39,500 will take silver prices to 41,000 levels. Mm. Oh, how are you looking at the gold prices also? Because we have more bullish voices on gold than silver as always. But uh, with gold at these current levels, uh, how is the charts working for you? Uh, see, COMEX gold has resistance at around $1,255, $1,260. And uh, that's a 200 DMA for COMEX gold. It's trading near resistance levels. So if uh, the commodity is able to hold the resistance levels, then there is a possibility that we might see a fall till. 1230 or 1220 dollar uh, that would be the very short term uh, uh, move for gold overall uh, closing about 1260 dollar will take gold prices to 1290 and 1300 dollars in uh, in next couple of months so at present purely for a trading perspective for next couple of days till the time resistance levels are not taken away it's better to be on sell side also in m6 gold what we have seen is that in last couple of days we have seen a selling pressure uh, uh, as uh, uh, looking at the chart, it seems that some more selling pressure can be seen in which we can see levels of around 31,000 or 30,950 levels. So for a trading perspective, one can initiate sell position in gold fab contract at around 31,300 levels. So it's better to sell on rise with a stop loss to be placed at 31,450 levels for the targets of 31,000 and 39,50 levels. All right. Those are the cues really coming in for the precious metal prices. Then, Sumit, thank you so much for joining us and help us making all of those strategies. And with that, that's all the time that we have on Closing Bill. Thank you so much for watching.